Uh, well, perfect. So it's a pleasure to have you here. And you're going to talk to us a little bit about cookie cutter science as well, right? Yeah, you're definitely right. <laughs> cool. I am personally interested in this talk as well. Um, because I, I really like Kedro and Kedro is like one step af after the cookie, uh, quick cookie cutter data science. So it's like, it's, it's inspired on, but we can have a chat about this later on. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. the floor is yours. Take it away. Okay. Then welcome to my talk, Python table manner and color cookie grass gracefully. Yeah. I'm Wei I'm a software engineer at Rock 10 Slides and also a volunteer at PyCon Taiwan. As you can see, this is a teacher for help from PyCon Taiwan. Also, I'm a maintainer of Committees and Tools, which is a tool I will mention in this talk. Today, I will illustrate how to first clean up your table before you eat your dinner, and we'll ensure you that you will put the correct table web on your table. Then we'll learn how to use this Tableware's elegantly. Because the steps are maybe tr too trivial for you, you need some mnemonic rest. And if you are asking others like Git to help you, you should say please. In such a, an occasion, you will like to speak formally. Um, when we ha have our knife to cut a cookie, we'll ensure our own safety. And the last step we'll see first the cookie. Starting from dependency management, this might be how we used to start, start a Python project. We create a virtual environment, and then we activate it. And after that, we'll free, pip freeze some packages into requirements.txt. But sometimes we just forget to activate the virtual environment, or we forget to add the package into requirements.txt. So we can use tools like pipinf. Uh, because pipinf can manage when manage your virtual environment and packaging at the same time. So you no longer need to manually sync up your virtual environment and your requirements.txt. It's also generate hashes from the packages pip in download from PyPI. So it can ensure you that you can get the same package next time you install from it. You can initial a virtual environment through pip in install. Then this is how an empty pip file looks like. Uh, pipinf use pip file and pip file.log to manage dependencies uh, as an alternative to requirements.txt. And the API is pretty much the same as pip, so you just need to type pipinf install uh, which package equal to which version. If you add a request to your virtual environment, it will update the pip file like this. And it will add this. Uh, this section into your pip file that lock. This hashes is generated from the code pipinf download from PyPI at that moment. The, uh, even if the next time you download it, the code is changed, but the version is still 2.22.0. Uh, pipinf will write an error, so you are guaranteed to have the exact same package next time. But sometimes you just don't need everything in your production environment. So you can install the packages into your development environment only through adding a dash dash dev argument. And it will appear in the dev package section in your pip file. And because we already set our virtual environment and manage our dependency at the same time, we need to run our pro Python program inside our virtual environment. You can do so by pip in run. Python, your program, or something like Pippin run Django management the pipe to start the web server. But some people might say that Pippin does not update that frequently, or it's just updated two months ago, and the lack of it is really slow, and it does not sync up with install requests instead of the pipe. Maybe you could try Poetry. Uh, the concept of Poetry and Pippin are alike, so I'll list the command here as a reference. Uh, for releasing a package, I will recommend you using Poetry because you don't have to manually uh, update dependencies on um, both pip file and sale.py. Poetry will do that for you. But for Python application, I'll say both Poetry and pip inf work for me. Testing. Python comes with a standard unit test, uh, unit test framework in its standard library but it uh, borrowed the concept from JUnit in Java. 
So today I want to introduce PyTest. Why should we use PyTest? Uh, because PyTest is considered to be more Pythonic and it's compatible with the old unit test style. And in unit test, you will need to use a third function like a third equal, a third true, or a third false, and extra, etc. But in PyTest, you just need to memorize a third. And the other side, you can use the same syntax as the normal Python you use. And PyTest provide better disc test discovery, advanced feature features, and it also comes with plenty of plugins. This is how we run PyTest. Actually, after we install our virtual environment, we should always install our packages into our virtual environment and run our Python program inside the virtual environment. This is how a unit test, a unit test style test looks like. First, we use a setup to prepare all the data needed in our test cases. But because uh, unit test is borrow the concept from JUnit, it's the setup function is camel cache, which, consider, which is considered to be non Pythonic, and will inherit a uh, unit test test class best class. And as I mentioned previously, we'll need to memorize the assert, that assert functions. And in PyTest, we use fixtures to prepare individual data for uh, individual test cases. So we no longer need the setup function. Also, we we don't need to, to inherit a best class. And we don't even need a class to run PyTest. And the assert function become much easier to memorize because you only need to use assert. And the, uh, the syntax afterward is just the same as how you use Python daily. And this is my configuration for PyTest. I use PyTest.ini for to configure PyTest because setup.config is not recommended for PyTest configuration nowadays. And after PyTest 6.0 is released, you can even configure PyTest through PyProject Tamil. These are the plugins I use in almost every of my Python projects. Uh, you will use PyTest mod for replace the object that are hard to test, like uh, if you your program interact with AWS, GCP, or other third-party services, you don't want to actually interact with them because it will cost you money. So you will want to use a fact object to, uh, to be tested in your te unit test. And PyTest coverage can show you which portion of your program is not covered by your, your unit test. And PyTest.xdist can uh, accelerate your test by distributing your test to multi-core. Coding style. As pro Python programmer, we not only want to write correct code, we also want to write elegant code. We can do so by Flathead. Uh, Flathead is a tool that can enforce style consistency across your Python project. It can also check possible error before you actually run your program and also eliminate the bad coding styles. In this example, I redefine uh, the OS library as a string, uh, which could be a possible error because after this line, you can and no longer use font methods like os.get current working directory because OS now is a string. And I add an additional space here, which is considered to be a bad coding style. After running Slack, it will tell you where are the errors and Bad, bad smells. Uh, this is my configuration for Flag A. I use setup.config. Uh, in this section, I will introduce you a lot of tools that relate to coding style. So by following this configuration, all these tools will not config, uh, conflict with each other. Piling. The functionality of piling is pretty much the same as Flag A, but it can generate more detailed reports. This is a, we use the stand code and, uh, and run pilot. This is the report it gives me. And if you run pilot with dash r argument, it can generate a even more detailed report, which you can compare with your previous pilot run to see where your coding style is improved in between the two different checks. 
and I use PyProject Thermal for configuration uh, for configuring PyTap. Uh, I used to use PyLint RC for configure PyTap, but I found that the default PyLint RC contain too many default values, which is distracting when and make it make me hard to find the thing I really want to configure. So I think I think PyProject Thermal or you can use Stellar.config to configure PyLint, which might be a better solution. My Py, uh, in Python communities, type annotation is now encouraged. So we now have tools like my Py to do st static type checking. And by doing so, so you can avoid possible runtime error because my Py can run compile type, type checking. And by doing type annotation, it can enhance your readability. Now on, uh, it's not only work as like dark string, it's machine checkable documentation. In this example, values is annotated as a list of stir, but we passing a list of integer into it, which would be a runtime error, but uh, tools like Flake and Pylint won't, won't warn you about this error, but my Py will. My Py will tell you that uh, you should actually pass in a list of stir instead of list of integers. The first argument indicates that you want to check all the file with the, the Py extension. And the second one will ignore the error that your third party library is not type annotated. Uh, because what we actually care about is where our code is uh, type annotated. And this is how I configure my Py through stale.config. These two lines are the configuration, are the arguments I showed in the previous patch. So after this, you no longer need to type the arguments. We can even tap one step forward by fixing the style automatically to black. Using black is really easy. You just need to run black dot and it will fix all the styles under your current work directory. This is how black reformat. The red one is the, old co uh, the code before black actually fix it. Because backslash is not recommended nowadays, black will use a script to do the black line. And it will fix the indentation and also add an additional space between command and its command and its content. Why should we use black? Uh, because the black code style is not configurable. You cannot tell black how to uh, how to format or I don't like this portion of black style. No, you cannot. You need to accept the black code style for your uh, for your whole file. You can not even uh, give it a temp ignore mark to format only a portion of your code. You need to format the whole file, and which lead to no more argument about which style is better. So you can focus on what really matters, uh, the value, the feature you want to deliver to your customers. And there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. It's from the Xeno Python. And this is my configuration for black. Uh, this is not for, for, uh, for black formatting. It's just to tell black uh, which file it should include and which file it should exclude. I thought in this, uh, in this Python file, I randomly import some libraries, but according to Pepe, we should start our libraries in the following order. We should first have standard libraries, uh, second third party library, and third our local application or library imports. And you should add a blank line between each group. After running ISO, it will uh, group this imports for you. In addition to group this, it will sort the libraries alphabetically. So the next time you want to find which, uh, which library is imported, it will be much easier to find than randomly sorted. And this is my configuration for ISO. Uh, this is all the coding style related tools I use for my Python project. And this are the command for formatting and linting, but it's just way too many commands. So we need some 
tools like Pine Invoke for task management. It's like a Mac file, but it's written in Python. Uh, I'll demonstrate how we use invoke in repo generator command line in practice. This is, <laughs> this is how we install our analyzer and run unit tests before we use invoke. We'll need to memorize this long command, but after invoke, the command become much shorter. But you might say, even, even if they are much shorter now, we still need to memorize them. But no, you don't. Actually, you, the thing, only thing you need to memorize is invoke dash L. It will list all the commands you implement. So how could we implement these commands? So test.py, you'll add this file to the root of your Python project, and then move the command to the text. And best of all, it can ensure that your Python program is run inside your virtual environment by adding a virtual environment prefix in your test.py. Um, after you introduce a bunch of text, you might want to modulize them through the concept of namespace. So as you can see now, the command becomes invoke build.develop. But wait, your command becomes even longer now. So now we need auto completion. Invoke, invoke com comes with a completion script. You can generate the script for each of your shell through this command. And after that, you can type invoke build.tab and it will show you all the options you can choose from. So why not just use Mac file? Well, because we are Python developers and some tasks might not be easy to handle through shell script and shell script in different shell the command might be different. And in PyInvoke, you can combine the power of Python and shell script. It's the best of both words actually. And because people might forget to do the check even if after we made the check much easier. So we can ask it to do the check through pre-commit. So how do pre-commit do the check for us? Uh, pre-commit can run some command before we do any git operation like git push and git commit. We'll first need to tell pre-commit what command we want to run. And in this example, I first use a repo local, which means uh, it will run the com local command in, on your computer. And the first hook is style reformat. I will check it at the stage commit and I will run invoke style reformat at this stage. The second one is style check. I will do style check when, when I do git push. There are also some existing hooks that is commonly used. So pre-commit has a repository Pre-commit hooks. For example, uh, I have introduced end of, fix, end, end of file fixers and trailing white space, which will remove the trailing white space in your files except markdown files. And popular projects like Black, Isolt, and even Flake has their own hooks on GitHub as well. So after we configure it, we need to install it into your local, uh, local repository through pre-commit install. Uh, because I mentioned I will use stat push and commit. So I install hook type pre-commit and pre-push in this example. After that, you do git commit and you will run the end of line fixer, trim the white space and do the style reformat. And when you want to push your code to your remote repository, it will do the first two and then we'll do style check without style reformat. Speaking of Git, we might want to cultivate a Git commit make convention. If you are like this guy and you will see Git log like this and it will make it really hard to find the right version to roll back to when you, your system goes down because all the commits are updated. You cannot distinguish them. So, Committison tools is here to help. Uh, by using CZ commit, which is a com command from Committison, you can you'll get a user and user interface that will first ask you 
which type of change is this one. And it also gives the user a hint that you should not mix a lot of different, com different changes into a single commit. Uh, for example, you should not add bug fix feature and refactoring into a single commit, which, which will make it really hard to review. And then it will ask you about which scope is it, the subject of it, and whether this commit is a breaking change. And you might want to add some, some more details to your, uh, to your commit. And then you might want to reference to your GitLab issue, GitHub issue, or some Jira ticket. This is a commit we just generated through a previous patch. And if you are continuously using commit set, you will see this kind of git log, which is much readable than update. Uh, commit send also comes with some advanced features. It can prevent you from not using commit send because people still forget to use commit send and they use git commit with update day sometime. And because uh, the rule we just use is conventional commit, we can use customizable commit rules. And because our commit message is standardized, we can auto bump our project version and generate change log to commit send it through the functionality of commit send. And best of all, I'll hold a sprint tomorrow and Sunday. So that spring, join us on virtual run 10. Security issues. You might have seen this kind of warning on GitHub. It tells you that some of your libraries might have security issues that you should upgrade your, your library to certain version. You can do so locally through safety. You can check the vulnerability by running safety check. In this example, it tells me that PyCrypto uh, 2.6.1 might be dangerous, so I need to update to a higher version. But if you are using pipinf, you can just run pipinf check. Uh, PIP, uh, safety will search the vulnerability in the CVS database for, uh, for the known vulnerabilities. Embedded, Bendy can do static analysis on, uh, to check common security issue in your Python program. And in this example, Bendy tells me that in this portion of my code, I have a median severity uh, security issue and Bandit, this is a, uh, how confident Bandit think this is actually an issue. And this is, uh, Bandit will also tell you how, why this might be a problem and how you could fix it. But not all the warnings should be fixed. In this example, it tells me that I should not use a cert. Um, it's because a cert might be ignoring some Python configuration. So if you are using a cert, to identify your user in your logging system, it might be a potential vulnerability. But we still need to use a cert in our test cases, right? So you should add test into your exclude section into your bandit configuration. But if you are now, but if you don't want to ignore the whole file, just some section or some lines in your code, you can add no secure after the end of the line of code you want to ignore the warning. So cool, let's talk about cookies, Pro project template. You might want to use all these manners in your, all your Python projects afterward, but configure it every time is really time consuming. So we could create a project template once and initialize projects through it afterwards through cookie cutter. This is my cookie cutter template that consists all of the tool I just mentioned and also a GitHub action and some documentation generating tools uh, inside this template. And the only thing you need to do is pip install cookie cutter, then add my URL to cookie, my cookie cutter template. It will first ask you some question like, uh, what's your project name? And in this example, I type Python table manner. And my template also lets you choose your dependency management tools. And this is how a generated project looks like. So how to make a template? 
you will need to first add a cookie cutter.json. The key is the value you want to fill in your template and the, uh, the value is the default value for that key. And in this example, it will ask user uh, whether uh, which, which dependency management tool they want to use. And this is a project template of my template, project structure of my template. Uh, the upper, upper part is cookie cutter configuration and the lower part is the template I, I use to create it. And cookie cutter follow the syntax of Jinja. This is an example in my template, how I initialize my environment. If the user choose pipinf as their dependency management tool, their init task will contain the command pipinf install. If they are choosing pointry, they'll, they'll in, uh, if the pipe will run pointry install. And sometimes you might want to run some check or some operation before and or after the project is generated. You can do so by adding hooks, post, uh, post or pre-generate project.py. In this example, if the user does not choose pipinf as their dependency management tool, I will remove pip file for them because pip file is not needed for other cases. And again, this is my, my cookie cutter template. So your journey toward a bad manner is now complete. There are other interesting tools that I don't have time to mention today and you might want to take a look at it. And these are the related talks I suggest you reading. So does anyone has any questions? Yeah, we can also chat on, on the Discord channel, talk, talk Python table manners. Yeah. Perfect, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. For I think we have time for one question. I just don't want to do this to you. So um, let's see. So yes, Gus is asking, do you find that committees and slows down your workflow? Uh, he finds it hard enough to split his commits up and not commit everything at once. Mm, I value readability more than uh, efficiency because uh, you can, surely you can add all the things into into one commit, but if you want to roll, roll back to to certain points, it will be hard to find. And if you uh, make something like refactoring and feature feature and bug fix into one commit, and you suddenly find find out that the bug fix it doesn't actually fix anything you want to roll back to, and after you roll back that commit, your feature will be gone. Your refactoring will disappear as well. So I would still recommend you to keep the commit uh, simple and yeah, that's, that's all. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for everyone that is um, that has questions, I have loads of questions here for you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any more time. Yeah, I just made like a block of like four of them for you to answer wow. on your channel. <laughs> nice. And Good. we have, yeah, we have a few more. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Gus. Uh, Gus also has a few more questions for you. So please just go into the Discord. The channel is uh, Talk Python Table Manners. Thank you very much. <laughs>